Good morning. It is 11 o'clock. I would like to call today's meeting to order. I will ask everyone to mute unless you're speaking. At this time, I would like to call upon Dr. Simpson to call the roll. Dr. Simpson, good morning. Good morning, President. Mr. Bartley. Present. Ms. Bay. Present. Mr. DeShield. Present. Dr. Getty. Present. Dr. Green. Present. Ms. Haley. Present. Dr. Lee. Present. Ms. McCusker. Present. Ms. McCarthy. Present. Ms. Morrow. Present. General Sumter. Present. Dr. Wilcox. Present. Mr. Wu. Present. Dr. Salmon. Present. And Mr. Crawford. Present. Thank you. The roll call is complete. Thank you. Mr. Shaw? Uh, you have a quorum and all of your members are present. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone and uh, welcome uh, the public for joining to join our meeting today. Um, I'd like to again welcome the staff and the members to the meeting. Um, we will be meeting virtually today. The public will be able to access us through the YouTube streaming. We're having some challenges with the town hall stream, but YouTube streaming is working. And that kit is located on the state board meetings uh, website. And the agenda and the materials are posted there as well. The archive video will be posted on the website. During the meeting, only state board members and staff will be able to speak. State board members will be asked to hold their questions until the end of the presentations. The state board members and staff should identify themselves when they're speaking. Dr. Salmon will respond to each question or she will call upon an, an appropriate staff member to do so. Voting will be conducted by a voice vote or and or roll call, depending upon the action. Mr. Schoen will ratify each vote. Uh, I'd just like to welcome everyone again and just open up uh, today's meeting with a, just a quick review. A month or so ago, the state board approved a set of priorities for the school year. The, the top priority on that list, the first one listed was that we, uh, that a priority of helping to find and, and select a new superintendent, another great superintendent to follow um, in the footsteps of our current superintendent and, and her predecessors. Well, that's underway. We have hired Greenwood and Asher. Uh, we will be contacting uh, individuals for interviews as well as scheduling town hall, virtual town hall meetings. So please stay tuned. You'll hear more about that. And we really look forward to getting your input. The next item we talked about was the issues around reopening school and doing it in a responsible way in a safe way and promoting education. So we try to restructure our meetings so that we focus on those topics. And as we go through those topics, we should be asking ourselves after each topic is, how can we apply what we've learned to improve the education for our children and to create a safe environment for our children and our staff? 
We've also said that being concerned about the emotional, uh, social emotional needs of the students and staff are very important. So as we hear this, we're gonna hear um, presentations today and tomorrow as we go forward. And then we also created a couple of uh, placeholders. The first one was really looking at thinking about how are we going to start next school year? What are some of the areas of learning loss and what can we do to accelerate learning? Uh, Dr. Sam is going to pick up on that topic a little bit more in detail on tomorrow. But this is a key important area. We're looking at this. We know that a number of other organizations and individuals are. And we just wanted just to let the public know that this is a priority of ours. And there's a number of things that are going on behind the scenes to position ourselves to do that. And then the final area was looking at beginning to identify a list of transformative, potentially transformative things that could be done. That we would have a list, have that available as we talk to prospective superintendent candidates. But then um, later in the year, once we've hired a superintendent, get their input on what should we be doing to make a difference. And as we look, um, I just want the public to know that we on the board, we are reading and looking at everything we can possibly do. We are working with the National School Board uh, Association to identify practices that other state school systems are using. We're outreaching. I'm personally outreaching to presidents of other state school boards to see what they're doing to share ideas. We're looking not only at just information from education sources, but we're also looking at information from other sources like the Economic Policy Institute that, that warns that, that we are dealing with a very, very significant challenge and that the challenge could have long-term implications. So we're trying this, and I know that the superintendent is involved and she is working with the other state superintendents. She's reaching out to a whole host of people. So the message I have for the community is that we are listening. We are trying to find ideas that would work in Maryland. We're open to hearing what other people are saying. We have an outstanding staff at MSDE, but it's always good to take a minute and look around and see what other people are doing because other states, other state boards, other parents throughout the country are looking at similar issues. So if we can find a great idea someplace else, as the superintendent has said, then that's what we will do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to move right into our agenda and call upon our superintendent, Dr. Salmon, to introduce the presenters. And the first topic is going to be the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment uh, Program. Good morning, Dr. Salmon. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you. Good morning, President Crawford, and good morning to everyone out there. It is uh, a beautiful day, and uh, we have a lot of really, really important uh, presentations today, so I'm excited to get started. Uh, the first presentation this morning is about our Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program. And since we have a number of new board members, we thought it would be really good to really have a nice discussion about what is our assessment program? And then where do we move forward to? Um, and we're not gonna answer all the questions today. We're gonna answer some of those questions today about where we go in the future with this. Um, much of that will be decided in January, but we wanted to give you a good overview of our assessment program and uh, as it stands right now. Um, so I'm gonna invite uh, Dr. Jennifer Judkins, who is our, um, 
uh, director and assistant superintendent of assessment and accountability and um, the guru of all that is assessment out there. And she's going to give us a really good overview of the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program. So Jennifer, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Salmon. Hello, President Coffer, Dr. Salmon, members of the board. Again, I am Jennifer Judkins. I'm the assistant state superintendent. I oversee assessment, accountability, and information technology. All of and let me see if I can share my presentation. Please let me know when you can see it. Yes, we see it. Is that on? Perfect. Okay. And is it in the right mode? <laughs> Let's make sure. You could go so to the need to presentation mode. All right. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. When I first put it up there, I couldn't see anybody else. So here we go. <laughs> All right, so um, today I'm going to give an overview of the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, what assessments are included from the state level. We will also talk about the time length of our assessments. I'll discuss federal peer review and its relation to assessment design. I'll also explain our technical advisory committee and their role in advising on development, design, and the soundness of our assessment system. Um, we'll talk about our administration um, dates and I'll have some updates from the board materials that you received. Um, we'll talk about the considerations for remote administration of our assessments. And lastly, we will look at the future plans for assessment in our state. Okay, so for the new Maryland Comprehensive Assessment, Assessment Program, Maryland has moved from administering the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers, or PARC, in Mathematics and English Language Arts, to developing our own state assessments in these content areas. Our state educators are a part of the writing, scoring process, and reviewing of all assessment items on our new MCAP assessments. And since June of 2020, 2020, over 325 of our Maryland educators have been a part of the assessment development events. So this is part of a one pager that is available on our website. We get a lot of questions um, from local school systems and the public about which assessments are state assessments. So um, we know that our local school systems also administer a lot of their locally designed assessments or interim assessments. So the ones from the state are the ones that are included here. This includes uh, mathematics in grades three through eight. This will be our MCAP mathematics, um, as well as all of our high school mathematics assessments in algebra one, geometry and algebra two. For English language arts, we um, administer ELA in three through eight, as well as grade 10. Of course, if students need to still pass the grade 10, they can take it in upper grades in 11 and 12. For science, we have our MISA five and eight, as well as high school MISA. And again, MISA stands for Maryland Integrated Science Assessment. And then those are those three contents are the ones that are also mandated by the federal government. So just keep that in mind. In our state, we also have two social studies assessments. Um, Social Studies 8, which this would be our first year of um, field testing that assessment, as well as high school government, which we've had for several years. Um, in addition to our general assessments, we have um, our additional assessments here. And for alternate assessments, those mirror our general assessments um, for the ones that are mandated federally. So the, that is alternate assessments in math three through eight and 10, as well as an alternate assessment in English language arts and literacy in three through eight and 10. And our alternate assessment in science for five, eight and grade 11. Additionally, we're required to administer assessments for our English language learners. So ours is the access assessment and that's given in grades K through 11. And lastly, we have our early childhood um, assessment, which is our Kindergarten Readiness Assessment, or KRA. So our new Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, all the assessments have been shortened from the previous lengths. So the ones that we administered in park, as well as the ones that were in state. So we um, met with our psychometric teams and we ensured that all of the assessments, even though in shortened in length, would still provide equitable and information to what we had previously provided for our assessment results. So this table gives an outline of where we were previously for time because one of the um, requests was definitely to shorten those assessments. Um, the information that we get from the assessments is very important. However, we wanted to balance that with the amount of time it was taking within the classroom. An additional requirement that we were um, 
given was to also have the assessments um, fit within a class period. So if you see here, um, the minutes per assessment for most of them are 40 minutes in length. Um, for English language arts, you can tell that that's a little bit longer. And the reason for that um, is that we just need to give, to give students the time to write. It just takes time for students to go through that process. So that um, assessment is a little bit longer within the class period. And after the first year of administration, when we have actual time lengths for students on task, we can always reevaluate that 70 minutes length, but we felt that that was safest to give um, when we first began these assessments. So you can see that all of our assessments have reduced in time, majority of, be, majority of them being down to 160 minutes or four units at 40 minutes each. And now, School systems always have the flexibility if they want to administer these um, multiple units in a day, they can always do that and adjust their schedule. But we made sure that we designed it in such a way if you wanted to give it within a class period that you were able to do that. Now I'll talk a little bit about federal peer review. So each of our state assessments that's used for federal accountability must go through something that's called federal peer review. So assessment peer review or the federal peer review is a process through which a state demonstrates the technical soundness of its assessment system. A state's success in its assessment peer review begins and hinges on the steps a state takes to develop and implement a technically sound state assessment system. A key purpose of Title I and ESEA, which was the Elementary Secondary Education Act, which of course has been updated to the Every Student Succeeds Act or ESSA, um, the purpose of this is to promote educational excellence and equity so that all students master the knowledge and skills by the time they graduate high school that they need in order to be successful in college um, and the workforce. A state accomplishes this in part by adopting challenging academic content standards and administering assessments aligned to those standards and then defining the levels of student achievement on the assessments. Specifically under Title I and the ESEA, each state is responsible for implementing a state assessment that is coherent and consistent within the state. The purpose of the department's peer review um, of the state assessment system is to support states in meeting statutory and regulatory requirements for implementing, implementing valid and reliable state assessment systems. So there, therefore, the quality of our assessment system is both developed with the help of our technical advisors and checked for quality by the federal peer review system. So I wanna talk a little bit about our technical advisors. Our technical advisory committee, and you'll often hear that referred to as our TAP, um, is comprised of national experts in educational assessment. They have expertise in areas of assessment design, computer adaptive testing, assessment accommodations, the uses um, of the test, as well as English language arts and math. The Technical Advisory Committee provides guidance on technical assessment matters pertaining to validity and reliability, accuracy and fairness, and the members of our TAC are highly regarded national experts who have been widely published in their fields. Our advisory committee is composed of six national experts. So the members of our TAC are listed here. The first is Dr. Stephen Sarici. He's a distinguished university professor, professor um, um, of the Center of Educational Assessment at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. We also have a retired professor, Dr. Winwin, who's been a part of our technical advisory for many years and is also a part of um, several of the technical advisory committees, which really helps because he brings in a very um, wide perspective. And he um, was also the associate editor of the Journal of Psychometry and the Psychometric and the Journal of Educational Statistics. Dr. Stephen Weiss is actually from Maryland originally. He is now the Vice President of Research at the Northwest Evaluation Association, as well as the doctor or the doctor, director of the doctoral program in assessment and measurement at James Madison University. And you'll know um, Northwest Evaluation Association is NWBA, also produces the MAPS test. Um, we have three members of our TAC who are from Maryland, Dr. Hong Zhao, who is a professor, professor in measurement at the University of Maryland College Park. She's also the director of the Maryland Assessment Research Group, who does a lot of work um, for us in terms of um, different research projects. 
Dr. Robert Lizitz is also a retired professor from the Univers University of Maryland and is also the chair of the Educational Measurement and Statistics Department. Dr. Tamika Payton is the chief executive officer of Psychometric Solutions here in Maryland, and they provide psychometric and educational services to both private and public K-12 and post-secondary institutions. So several members here in Maryland as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to our administration timeline. We've had a lot of questions about what our testing windows are. Um, I flipped these slides only because I wanted to do an introduction before I um, presented the table. And um, we knew that for testing students this year, it's going to be pretty unique because we've got um, uh, not all students coming back into school until second or um, second semester or third quarter, um, so fourth quarter. So we've adjusted our windows to extend the time um, for students who need to be in person to take their tests. And we've also opened all of our windows early so that if students are coming in for a limited amount of time, that there's plenty of time within that window if they need to um, test students, you know, in smaller groups than they would normally. So you'll see that in the testing calendar that we've made um, a lot of adjustments. Um, another concern was that students who took um, some of their courses within the first semester and, need, and we're not going to return school to school until second semester. They wanted to make sure that they had the opportunity to take their assessment as close to um, the end of their course. So you'll notice in the, the window that it'll open up right at the beginning of second semester. So if you just ended a first semester course, you're not in school yet, but you're returning second semester, you have the opportunity to take that assessment as soon as possible. So um, I have several things that are highlighted here uh, or changed the font to blue, and it's because there were some adjustments there. Um, and some of these were updates. Our access for ELs at the bottom of our screen um, between the time that I had put together the presentation um, and today, we actually had an adjustment to that window. So if you notice here, we're trying to, again, better accommodate um, students. Previously, that window um, was early and would start in January, and we realized that some students aren't coming back, so we extended it out through the end of May, as well as opened it um, at the beginning of February, which we think will better accommodate our students. Um, you'll notice here for our high school government and some of our high school tests, the window is opening now in um, February. Typically, that window doesn't open um, for a few months after that, but we're trying to accommodate those students who are coming in, finishing a course from first semester. And then um, you can see all of our other dates here. So our high school government, we will open a window. Um, we call this our, our first window, our January window. Um, so January 11th through February 5th, those are for students um, um, who need that assessment and want need a score reported quickly. So then um, that window is available for them. Um, for MCAP, ELA, and high school government, we'll start again February 22nd, and that will go all the way through June 4th. So if you need to test students in small groups, you have that opportunity. Our high school MISA is more of um, closer to our typical window, but that's May 3rd and then extended longer through June 4th. MISA 5 and 8, we can see that's the, the normal window we have. It's just March, generally the month of March. And then ELA, um, sorry, ELA, English Language Arts and Math uh, 3 through 8. We have that longer testing window there opening it at the beginning of March going through June. And then DLM is our dynamic learning maps. That's our alternate assessment. And then um, we've also adjusted that window to provide additional time. Um, we know that there have been questions about remote administration. So we did consider remote administration of our MCAP assessments. Um, and then speaking with our technical advisors as well, um, this, the statement here, which is second, um, was one that was provided by them. There are a lot of extreme um, differences in technology resources available to students, and we're trying to find an equitable means for delivering these assessments for remotely. So here are some of the things that we considered as we were looking at remote administrations. Um, we were concerned that the test would not be administered in a secure environment. Obviously, when students are in school, we have uh, the ability to control what that environment is, what uh, materials students have available to them, um, as well as who is in the room. Um, so there's no way to ensure that the students would, re would not receive external assistance, assistance, either from family members or being able to use other devices. Um, and then another concern with um, our MCAP program being 
new. We're trying to develop as many items as we can to use for future administrations. Any item, um, test item that is used within our assessment, if it's administered in a non-secure environment, we would have to what we call release that item. That means that we make it available to the public to be used for other purposes within the classroom or just to see what the test looks like. Um, and unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to continue to use that item. So that was um, would be very detrimental to our MCAT bank as we're trying to build um, our new assessments. So those were things that we had considered and then determined that a remote administration of MCAP would not be um, a good choice for us at this time. And then I wanna talk a little bit about our future plans for our assessment system. One of them, of course, as we've heard, is our computer adaptive testing or for short CAT. Um, these assessments do adapt to the student's performance level. Um, and what the computer adaptive testings would be in our mathematics and English language arts. Um, so the first year we call, we're administering what's called a fixed form. So this is a normal um, assessment that measures students from low all the way up to high. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how computer adaptive is different than that in a moment. Um, and in subsequent years, all grades in math and uh, mathematics and English language arts three through seven and algebra one would be computer adaptive. Question did come up, why is it not um, for mathematics eight, as well as um, geometry and algebra two? The reason for that is a lot of our grade eight students are taking the high school assessments. So uh, many are taking algebra one, some are taking geometry or even algebra two. Um, and then also for once a student has taken algebra one, um, for their high school assessment, they're not always taking geometry and algebra two. So what happens is the numbers of students taking those tests is really diminished. And so being that we have a smaller um, number of students taking it, we can't actually field test as many items, which means it's gonna take many more years to, de to really develop the bank in those grade levels or in um, those content areas and then that grade level in eight. Um, and so we're hoping in, um, years later that we will be able to go computer adaptive, but just for the fact that we have a low number of students taking those tests, um, we can't go computer adaptive as quickly as we could for the um, other uh, assessments. So just to talk really briefly about computer adaptive testing, on one of my previous um, presentations, we went a little bit more in depth, but I just wanna give you a little snapshot of what it looks like. So in general, this is what happens is that a student is given an initial set of items and you can see on um, my very simple diagram at the bottom, we have usually on an assessment, we um, I'll have items all the way across from easy all the way up into hard because we need to measure students at every level. We need to figure out where a student is at and be able to, to determine that cut. So what we do here is our initial set of items is somewhere in the middle. For a student who gets all of those um, initial items correct, maybe they'll get an item that's a little bit harder. So we're gonna start to narrow in to what their um, performance level is. If a student gets some right and some wrong, maybe we'll continue to give them items right in that medium range. For a student who is getting um, the initial items incorrect, we'll start to give them items that are closer to what their performance level is. So a little bit easier items. In computer adaptive testing, we have to ensure that we are still, um, so we can get to what their performance level is a little bit faster. Um, but remember as a state test, uh, we also wanna make sure that we're measuring the breadth um, of our standards. So we wanna make sure that we're, even though maybe we know this is about where the performance level is for a student, maybe halfway through the test, we will continue to give test items in that range, but to cover the rest of the standards. Because if we're gonna report on how a student is doing in a particular area of content, we need to make sure that we're actually administering um, items in that area. So I think there was a question now, does it make it um, the test shorter? What it does is it does um, a better job of accurately measuring where the student is. But if we were to shorten the test any more than we've already shortened our test, um, we would lose that ability to report on how a student is doing in, um, an area of context. So um, I want to make sure that I address that as well. But in general, that's how computer adaptive testing um, goes is that you give an initial set of items and you start to narrow in on um, what that student's performance level is a little bit faster and then give them test items in their range so that you don't have a student who's maybe a lower performing student getting lots of hard items. We wanna to try to get student or items that are in their range so that we can better accurately measure where they're at. So that's just a little snapshot of computer adaptive testing. Um, and then this just is a little explanation of what I just talked about there. And also ensuring that we um, fulfill the assessment blueprint, which is making sure that we cover the breadth of our standards. Um, another future plan that we have is for 
kindergarten, first grade, second grade, or K2 assessments. So one of the goals um, is to be able to um, identify students who um, have academic needs between the KRA, which is given at the beginning of kindergarten, and um, the assessments at the end of third grade. And so we've been asked and tasked um, to try to develop assessments so that, again, we can better identify those students early. So we're in the beginning stages of this. Again, this has been an ask, and so um, we can start to move forward in developing those assessments. And I personally have a first grader, and I was always so worried about how would he be assessed as I watched him in kindergarten? And now as I watch him in first grade, I'm like, we can completely assess <laughs> first graders, and they're pretty independent. And, um, so I'm pretty excited actually to start the work on developing um, K2 assessments in mathematics and English language arts. And then of course, we'll be doing this alongside our assessment experts um, to make sure that those assessments uh, measure exactly what we're looking for to tie KRA with um, grade three. So that is actually the end of my presentation and um, I wanted to know if there are any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Junkins. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Let me now open it up to questions from the board. Dr. Junkins, if you can take your presentation down so that I can see the board members, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Very <laughs> nicely done. Mm -hmm. Questions from the board, please. Anyone? Just. Looks like, uh, oh, got a couple here. Um, if you can speak up, because I'm still having some challenges in seeing everyone. So if you can speak up with your name, that way I can recognize you. Make sure you're. Right. This is Rachel McCusker. Yes, Ms. McCusker, please. Thank you, Ms. Judkins. Your, your presentation was, was very good and very informative. I just had two questions. Um, the first one was when we talked about this year's uh, assessment calendar and the fact that we're, we really don't have a way to reasonably do remote administration. Um, right now, in a lot of the districts, parents have the option to opt their children into 100% remote even when schools come back for hybrid instruction. Uh, what is the plan for students whose parents are choosing to keep them 100% remote? We can't really test them if we don't have a remote option. And I don't disagree with not having a remote option. I think everything you've laid out here is, is spot on with the problems with the remote administration. So what, what is the department thinking about that particular uh, scenario? So I'm going to answer that, um, Ms. McCusker. Um, we have uh, we have basically decided that when students are able to be in school, they can be assessed. It is going to be very difficult to um, go against the advice of our TAC team um, to do any kind of remote testing. So I think the, the real quick and easy answer to that is that if, if students are virtual, we're going to have to find another way to assess their uh, knowledge of the standards, but I don't think we can use our standardized uh, MCAP program. So it looks like maybe some kids will be able to have it and some will not. We'll have a something alternative, yes? I think so, yes. Okay, thank you. And the other question I have is in the, I know you're just in the beginning stages of taking a look at these K-2 assessments. And I had the same concern that you spoke of right at the beginning of this slide when you talked about how are we gonna do this with our young ones. And I do have that concern that, that these tests be developmentally appropriate and, and not, uh, you know, over ta taxing for our youngest students. Um, that, so I do have concerns about the developmental appropriateness of testing kids at that at that age. Absolutely, yeah. And we um, we started some of the work with um, some folks at Westead, and they actually developed quite a few assessments in this area. So we feel pretty confident in that. And I, I felt the same way. And I actually watched my first grader uh, take an NWEA test the other day, and I was like, and I see what he can read. And they have like headphones, and the question will be read to them, and then they can answer on screen and. I was like, okay, yeah, I felt pretty confident. Now for kindergarten, there's still gonna be probably teachers helping to administer that. So not probably a little bit further than KRA, but they're still gonna have to assist. But yeah, in first and second grade, I think we're gonna, 
we'll be able to develop assessments um, with, and it shouldn't be too taxing for the kids. Yeah, I feel a little bit more confident about that now and partially just having a first grader and watching him. So, and then like I said, the folks that we're working with um, have been designing these for some time now. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Is there another question? Uh, this is Ms. Morrow. Ms. Morrow, please. I have, so Ms. McCusker got my, <laughs> my big question about the remote administration. Um, because I'm I'm concerned about that one too. The other two questions are quick questions on the administration dates table. What is the differentiation between the second line that says MCAP ELA Mathematics and then the line <coughs> further down that says ELA Mathematics three through eight? Thanks. Yeah, I should have clarified that. Um, that would be our high school assessment. So. Um, I think I was trying to shorten the mathematics piece because I'd have to include algebra one, geometry, um, and algebra two. So it's ELA 10 on that top line and mathematics, uh, algebra one, two, and geometry. So the high school ones are administered a little bit sooner. Okay. The opportunity, yeah, thanks. And then my other question, when you talk about the K through two assessments, you said that we were asked to do that. Who is that coming from? The legislature, is that coming from the local districts? Who is that ask coming from? That was uh, actually from the state board, Ms. Morrill. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> this is Gail. Oh, Dr. Dr. Uh, rather, uh, Senator Bates, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. That's my son. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, are are we when are we missing a whole year of assessment because of COVID? Uh, I've had some people ask, you know, how do we assure these students are ready to move on to the next grade, you know, and and so forth. Are we in any way um, able to assess that the impact of COVID on? Uh, where the students would be? Is that part of this? Yes, Senator, um, that's a really uh, timely question. Um, no pun intended. Um, we uh, we definitely are, are concerned about learning loss and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that tomorrow and we're gonna talk a lot about it in January when we look at the first term metrics from our school systems that will be submitted to us. Um, so it is going to be something we spend a lot of time discussing because you're correct. We had to waive the assessments last spring. So we don't have, we have a year that we've lost for, um, you know, any kind of standardized state testing. However, as we get into further discussions about assessments in the future, there are a lot of different ways for us to be able to track our student success. And I do, am not a psychometric uh, person, but I know that Dr. Judd can, can explain some of the systems we're gonna be able to use to go back and look at a prior year's assessment maybe have a skipped year and then also look at the next year of assessment and still be able to equate student progress. And so we've been looking into that very closely and that's probably what we're gonna end up trying to do in the future. So great question, we'll stay tuned and we'll try to fill you in in more detail in coming meetings. Okay, one more question. I know uh, over the years when I would talk with my community college president and so forth, there would be students that would have to be taking, you know, remedial courses uh, at the beginning of their college years. And I'm wondering with the, the failure to or an un, inability to test at this point, are we going to see more of our students that are graduating from high school going on to college uh, in a position of not really being prepared and maybe being unaware of that uh, until they get to to college or community college so again the testing I, you know is, is i guess a part right. of that well, yes, but that most of our tests are done way before students um, are, you know, going to be graduating because we want to build those skills early on uh, to make sure they are career and college ready. And that's what that original legislation was uh, of 2013 when you were actually in the Senate. 
Um, so we have hopefully things in place as uh, safeguards so that that doesn't occur because we don't want students spending a lot of extra time and money in remedial courses when they go to community college or college. So it's certainly something we'll be keeping a, a, a watch on. Just concerned that this basically almost an entire year absolutely of, of not being able to track really has me concerned about whether or not these students are going to be you know behind the april as they go on thank you i share your concern senator All right, thank you any other questions okay if you have a question please speak up because i can't see everyone okay looks like we don't have any additional questions. Again, uh, thank you very much. This was very, very good. We appreciate it greatly. Thank you. Dr. Samick, and I guess we're now ready to move on to talk about the waiver request for seniors taking American government assessment in the 20 2021 uh, school year. This is an action item for the board. Thank you, President Crawford. And just to remind the board, um, you already did uh, approve a waiver for last year's seniors in April. This waiver is pertaining to this year's seniors in the 2021 school year. And I'm actually going to ask Mary Gable to walk the board through this particular waiver request. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, Dr. Salmon, and good morning, Mr. Crawford, Ms. Hall, and members of the State Board. There are two regulations which apply to the American government, um, apply to American government as a graduation requirement. One of them is that the students must earn one credit in American government as part of their credit requirements. And the second is students must pass the high school assessment in American government. And you heard Dr. Judkins referring to a number of the assessments um, that the um, that Maryland administers. For the most part, students take American government in the ninth grade, perhaps some in the 10th grade, but there are a variety of reasons that students may be taking it as seniors. It may be that they um, transferred to the school as sophomores or juniors, um, and it may be that they did not pass the course originally. So there are a number of students taken as a seniors as a senior. In addition, high schools have a variety of schedules. Some, some courses are offered all year long for a certain amount of time. Other courses are offered in what we call a block schedule where the students finish the course at the end of first semester. Those students that are finishing the course at the end of uh, first semester are students who have been, may not, may not be in school at this time. You heard Dr. Judkins talking about secure assessments, which we must give it, we must have in order to administer the American government high school assessment. Given the pandemic and its impact on the ability to administer the secure assessment, with many schools not open for in person assessments, we're requesting on behalf of Dr. Salmon a waiver for seniors only for both taking and passing the high school assessment in American government students must still earn one credit in the course American government. With that, we're open for a question for questions. And as Mr. Crawford said, this is an action item. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gable. Let's uh, do we have any questions from the board? Seeing no questions. The chair is now open for uh, a motion. This is Mrs. McCusker. I uh, make a motion that we support this waiver request. Mrs. McCusker, Mrs. Warner, and uh, General Warner. So we have motion to accept from Ms. McCusker and seconded by General Sumter. This time, open it for questions. Seeing no questions, I'm going to ask Dr. Simpson to call the roll for a vote. Thank you. Mr. Bartlett. Aye. Ms. Bates. 
Aye. Mr. Deshik. Aye. Getty. Aye. Dr. Green. Aye. Ms. Allen. Yes. Dr. Lee. I'm sorry, Dr. Respond. Agree. Okay, thank you. Ms. Lacosta? Yes. Dr. Miller McCarthy? Yes. Ms. Laurel? Yes. General Sumter? Aye. Dr. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Wu? Aye. And President Crawford? Aye. Aye. The vote is complete. Thank you. Mr. Shaw? Um, the motion carried. It was unanimous. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I propose that we continue with our meeting. We have set uh, a break. We're actually moving ahead of schedule. Um, so, Dr. Semin, are you prepared to um, take us to the next item? The uh, the school uh, year, um, the Maryland High School Graduation Task Force recommendation. Absolutely, Mr. Crawford. I'm ready to move forward. And I uh, just want to say that uh, over the course of the four years and now going into the fifth year of my tenure as state superintendent, I think one of the most important uh, uh, work that we did was around the task force on graduation. Um, we had not looked at graduation in Maryland in over 50 years. And so um, for uh, for this to occur and, and it to occur so uh, based on research and based on so much stakeholder involvement, I'm really excited to review the recommendations that the board has already approved. And there's one more that you're gonna to have to look at approving in January. And I'm not gonna take any of the thunder away from Dr. Williamson because she's worked extremely hard on this presentation. And if I say too much more, I'm, she's gonna come across her office and probably knock on my door. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Williamson. And I know that um, Ms. Gable is going to present her slides and, uh, uh, and here we go. Okay, well, thank you so much. And good morning, Mr. Crawford, Ms. Halley, Dr. Salmon and members of the board. And I'm glad that Dr. Um, Salmon introduced that way about me working really hard on this. It's really trying to pull the work of a significant uh, job that we had in looking at the graduation task force together into something that you would understand and be able to um, see how it progressed through the last couple of years. Cause I think that's really important for you to know. So I'm here today to provide you with an overview of the work and the recommendations of the high school graduation task force. And I was looking to see if that was in presentation mode. I'm thinking it is, it doesn't look big to me right now. The work of this group was first shared with the state board more than two years ago in October of 2018. At that time, two of our board members served on the task force, Dr. Justin Hardings and Ms. Michelle Guyton who is now, of course, Dr. Michelle Guyton, who is now Dr. Guyton. Two years ago, our plan was to discuss all of the recommendations in the report, 12 of which would require a change to the high school graduation regulation. We hope to go through, thoroughly review each one of those and discuss each recommendation requiring board action over the course of a year. And once all 12 were decided, we would bring the full revised graduation regulation to the board for their review and then request permission to publish it for public comment. As you might have surmised, we did not complete that work in 2019, not because it wasn't important, but because of some external factors that slowed down the process. It doesn't mean we didn't keep working on pieces that had been previously approved by the board. And once the board approved that recommendation, we began to do some preliminary transition towards it especially in terms of some of the recommendations that didn't require board action because there were a number of things that were suggestions for the board to consider. We now need to get this approval process back on track as Dr. Simon said. Since most of you were not members of the board during the discussions of this work, we thought that this December board meeting would be an absolutely perfect time 
to give you an overview of it so that we would be able to come back and talk to you at the end of this meeting about the one still recommendation that needs to be discussed and approved by you. So that we would come back in January, provide time for the full discussion of that recommendation. And in your board materials, you were provided a copy of the full task force report. And I brought mine with me. I'm sure you have seen yours. It was attached to your packet. And mine is very tab because I use it all the time to go back and remind myself of what happened and why it happened and what kinds of data that we looked at. Um, we also have had several other documents that we had made available that we can make available to you if you're interested in looking at them. But if you go on our website where this document's been posted since 2018, you're going to be able to get links to some of the research that we did look at. So you can certainly get a full understanding of what the task force looked at. The report provides considerable background information, the rationale for the decisions, and research behind each of the recommendations. There were a lot of factors that came into play that led to the establishment of our task force. They're clearly reflected in the narrative of the report, but among those factors were the park scores, I remember when they were out in first and center for everybody, the NAEP scores, bridge assessments, and graduation data. Also having an impact was Senate Bill 317, the More Jobs for Marylanders Act, which says that by January of 2025, 45% of high school graduates will complete a career and technical education program, earn industry recognized occupational or school credentials, or complete a registered or other youth apprenticeship. Currently, the state average is in the mid 20s. The bill requires setting income earnings goals for high school graduates who do not earn a college degree. And then of course there were the nationwide, there was a nationwide concern about student performance, especially compared to several other international sites and a few sites within the United States. There were many articles in educational journal, journals, op-ed articles, newspaper headlines, stories about the declining performance of America's students. And I just have to mention that was all before the pandemic and its impact on education. But at the very heart of our concerns was the meaning of our Maryland diploma. Did it reflect the kind of student we wanted to produce? It was clear that it was time to examine all of this. So the task force was charged with examining the current regulation. We were to determine if changes were needed in three areas of focus. We were to look at credit and program requirements, assessment requirements, options for awarding diplomas. And we were asked to complete the work by June of 2018. Interestingly, when we went back and looked at the high school graduation regulation, we found there had only been minor program changes to the graduation regulation over the past 40 years. As a matter of fact, the overall regulation had not changed significantly in its topics and things that it addressed um, since the 1970s, even though the world that we prepare students for has changed drastically. And we knew this was really important work that we were going to do, and we wanted a very broad stakeholder group of people to provide input. 24 organizations or stakeholder groups were invited to have a representative serve on the task force. Letters went out in December, and meetings began in January and ran every other week until the end of June. If members couldn't attend, they sent someone from their organization to represent them, generally the same person. And attendance was excellent throughout the process. And remember, this was pre-pandemic. Meetings were in person, and we had representatives coming from across our state. They took it so very seriously that they felt it was important to attend all meetings. Dr. Dara Shaw, our Executive Director of the Office of Research, and I co-chaired the task force. And our job was to structure the work, provide resources, record the recommendations, and ultimately bring those recommendations to the board and superintendent. Dr. Shaw and I were there to represent the work of the members and present it to the board. The decisions represented the thinking of the members of the task force. In order to accomplish the charge in the time allotted, we did much of our work in three committees, providing time for full group presentations from experts and time to share and get feedback on what each committee was thinking and planning. We did that because one group's work 
might have an impact on what the other group was considering. Think about that in terms of credit and program and then um, the kinds of assessments or the kind of diploma that we we're going to have. So we want to make sure that we we're all on the same page. We um, met consistently, as I said, through those days, of the, um, through the year up until the end of August. And then we had a final meeting in September. I think it's important to note that when Dr. Shaw and I planned the work of the task force, we established that all recommendations would consider current research, data, and policies on the impact of credits, assessments, and diploma types on college and career readiness and other outcomes. Research and data were provided every meeting at the request of committee members. Further, given the diverse set of task force members and their experiences, participants set a norm early on in agreeing to consider information that was well supported by research or data. And even in that information that conflicted with their previously held beliefs, they were going to consider it. Dr. Shaw established and maintained a resource hub that was utilized by all of the members. Only peer reviewed or otherwise high quality sources were used. Further, the source of each resource was also carefully considered so that resources presented a neutral, unbiased, and complete approach to each topic. Very early in the process, task force members established guiding principles that kept them focused as they moved through the discussions and the decisions. Would our recommendations, number one, enhance students' knowledge and skills? Very critical. Would it consider personalization? What was important to individual students, what their programs were, and groups of students, and ensure equity across all of our students and across all of our counties. Task force members worked in committees that um, with the opportunities to bring committee work to the entire group. The MSDE task force staff had to meet several times each week for planning, ensuring that the needs of the task force were being met, and ensuring that meetings continue to move forward. So next I want to show you the credit requirements. This is what we currently have in place. The total number of credits needed for a Maryland High School Diploma is 21 credits as reflected here. The task force kept a focus on the number of credits required for graduation as shifts in that number could make it difficult for schools and students to have the flexibility they need to focus on areas of interest in their selected pathways or to make up classes that they might need to repeat. Also, each school district can modify the number of required credits for their district as long as they include those required by the state. And you can see here what the number of required credits were in each of the core areas and in our support areas. And I'm not going to read them to you, but I wanted you to see those. And I also wanted to mention that elective programs and instruction need to be developed at the local school level and that they have to be open to all students and they need to focus on in-depth study and required subject areas. And in the area of environmental literacy, which I don't believe is on there, but it was something that came up through the legislature, all students have to complete a program designed by the local school systems, and that program has to be approved by the state superintendent. Most school systems infuse that into their curriculum from um, early grades through high school. So now the next slide just shows you a difference in the current requirements, which I just showed you that were in the black type. And the red print is the recommendation of the task force. And we're gonna be talking about each of those areas in red and why they were recommended and then why they were approved. But I just wanted you to see those, see there aren't a lot of changes. Um, the requirements across our 24 school systems range from a minimum right now of 21 credits to 26 credits. I can speak for Queen Anne's, who um, went to 26 credits and did a block schedule and had a lot of elective opportunities for students, but students had opportunities to move through the program faster if they needed to. Um, 14 school systems require a fourth credit of math already. And you'll see that on this slide, we show that we're recommending a fourth credit and we're gonna talk about that next. Only one school district requires four credits in all four content areas. Seven school districts require a financial literacy program as a standalone course with credit requirement. And when you read the report, you'll see that each required credit was examined to determine if it was necessary, if it was needed. So where you see English with four credits, we had an expert from our division of instruction and from local school systems come in and talk about English 
numbers 9, 10, 11, and 12, and what was involved in it, if it was needed, or if it needed to be modified. And so um, you'll see that there were a lot of things that we felt we really had securely in place. During the past two years, each of the recommendations reflected above was approved by the board. In the next portion of this review, I'm going to provide background on what each of the recommendations was and why those recommendations were made. So we um, began the first discussion of the recommendations. The board asked that we develop a timeline that spread the discussion of the recommendations requiring a change in the regulation across the 1920 school year with the final goal of completing the work at the end of the school year. It was agreed that the board would approve or not approve a recommendation and or maybe adjust it. And when we had been through all 12 recommendations, as I said at the beginning, we'd bring back a revised regulation that would reflect the changes that had been supported. So as you can see from the chart, the recommendations on this chart deal with the part of the charge to the task force, it says at the top, credits and content. As you look down the first column, you'll see it reflects five recommendations under credit and content, credit and program that require a regulatory change. Then to the right, you see columns with dates that each recommendation was discussed and approved. So if you go back to those board meetings on those dates, you can see that was done. The first area highlighted in yellow is math. And as you can see, the recommendation is to make the fourth math credit a required credit for graduation. Each recommendation that I plan to address from here till the end, um, is gonna be treated in the same way. You'll see it on the chart or timeline. Then you'll see what the current regulation was. We'll talk about that. You'll see the rationale for the recommendation and you'll see the recommendation that was approved. I wanna thank Debbie Ward, our coordinator of mathematics for being here today and for her leadership and guidance on this portion of the report. We'll go to the next slide. And this is what's in the annotated code currently. And we'll stay in the annotated code probably. Currently, this is what is there regarding math credits at the high school. We have a statute that requires that students enroll in math course each year that they're in high school. Minimally, they need to enroll in four credits of math. And there's a lot of history behind that, and I'm not going to go into it, but if we end up coming back to why did that happen, there were lots of reasons for why that happened. The legislature put that in place. Now you'll see that we have two things in place as well. We have two regulations that support or expand that statute. You'll see that COMAR 13A.03.2.03A um, repeats the requirement that students be enrolled in a mathematics course each year of high school. COMAR clarifies that it's intended that this be for up to four years of high school unless the fifth or sixth year of math is needed to meet a graduation requirement. So each year students are in high school, they are going to take a math credit. Comar 13A.03.03.03 defines the math credits that need to be taken. One credit must be in algebra, one in geometry. The third credit is not defined. Students can take anything from algebra two to applied mathematics, to pre-calculus, to high school statistics, or quantitative literacy. So if you were to take and be, if you were able to take the time to review your task force report, we saw that the task force in studying this requirement spent quite a bit of time talking to administrators and teachers, reviewing research and looking at workforce needs and feedback. Through a report from the Education Commission of the States done in January of 2018 and just released again this year, we learned that the states vary in their math requirement anywhere from two to four credits of math. And I've listed some of those there for you. I'm not going to read them at this point. We also spent considerable time surveying our own school systems and learning that we had 15 of our 24 school systems already requiring four math credits for graduation. They saw how critical that was. We spent considerable time looking at a number of rigorous research studies and learned that the more math students were exposed to math in high school, the better were the labor market outcomes, including wages, increased financial literacy, and increased student engagement in high school. One study found that state changes to minimum high school math requirements 
were especially beneficial to students of color. The task force supported courses being aligned to students' goals and pathways. This fit our guiding principle of personalization. The University of Maryland system requires four years of math, including Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. Students who complete Algebra 2 prior to their final year still have to complete four-year um, course or courses, four-year program, um, taking a course or courses that utilize non-trivial algebra, such as Algebra 2, Trigonometry, Pre-Calculus, Calculus, Statistics, College Algebra, et cetera. I'm just going to mention that we do have a group that's looking um, at those kinds of course requirements and we're working on community and university now and looking at what kinds of pathways we would have available for students, not only K-12, but through K-16. Um, one of the problems that we heard um, that from counselors and principals and teachers was that all those students didn't have to enroll in a math course each year. They only had to earn the um, credit in three of them for graduation. We heard that students often didn't value or worry about earning that fourth credit. The members of the task force felt math was a very valuable skill and that it really was one that should be taken seriously. And they thought it was important that students do earn four math credits. So if you go to the next slide, based on the rationale noted on the previous slide, the task force has modified the current regulation shown in black print in the current regulation said students must be enrolled in a math course each year in high school. And they added red print that adds to that requirement that students must earn four credits of math as part of their graduation requirement. There is still the requirement that two of the credits are Algebra 1 and Geometry. The other two credits should be appropriate to the student's pathway. In other words, not all students will take Algebra 2 and Calculus. Some may find it meets their needs better to take Algebra 2 and High School Statistics or maybe Applied Mathematics and Mathematical Modeling. We're currently, as I said, working through a number of pathways that students will have available. But as I said, this is something that the um, board endorsed and said that we would move forward on that with four credits of math. I'm going to move on to the next area. The next recommendation, it was approved, it was, um, was out of one regarding health education. Ms. Susan Spinato, the Director of Instructional Programs, and Ms. Leah, Jas Leah Jaspers, Health Education Specialist, have been before the board several times. And they came to the board to have the health curriculum approved it's fairly recently. That was presented in June of 2019 and approved in October of 2019. Then in December, Mrs. Spinato came to the board to discuss the need to increase the health credit requirement from a half credit to one credit. So what I'm really sharing here today is the part of the task force recommendation that is the change in the credit requirement. Go to the next slide. Currently, this is the requirement that's in place. Students must earn one half credit in health education to graduate. A considerable amount of legislation um, having an impact on our health education program has been enacted since that portion of our graduation regulation was established. Since the legislation has occurred, it's become more and more difficult to teach our basic health program, plus what has been added through statute at the level it needs to be taught, because no additional time has been added to the health requirement in our high school regulation. And we see there are the different pieces of legislation. There are many benefits to having a strong health education program. This is part of our rationale. The schools can provide a safe, non-judgmental environment for students to discuss the issues with which they have to deal on a daily basis. As educators, we have an opportunity to reduce health risk behaviors and promote lifelong positive health behaviors. From a prevention standpoint, a health educator is a, in a unique position to identify student health needs and connect that student to need, needed resources within the school and or the community. If you had time to go back and review your task force report, you probably saw that the task force spent time talking to administrators and teachers, to reviewing research, 
and to reviewing recommendations and feedback from the Maryland State Health School Council and the Health Physical Education Advisory Board. We have the content and the strategies in place. We just need the time to implement them. So, based on that rationale noted on the previous slides, the task force modified the current regulation and recommended an increase in the requirement from one half credit to one full credit while in high school. The board agreed that this was the direction we needed to go and approved moving forward with that recommendation. So that's the second recommendation we brought forward and that was approved. Next recommendation discussed and approved under credit and program was that of technology education. The recommendation there was to transition from a requirement of one credit technology education to one credit of computer science. This was discussed and approved at the October 2019 Board of Education meeting. I want to thank Tiara Booker Dwyer, Assistant State Superintendent for the Division of Career and College Readiness for being here today and for her guidance and leadership in this area. As we did with the last two recommendations, we'll take a look at what is currently in the regulation, then at the rationale for the change, and then at the final recommendation that was approved. The current regulation is in Comar 13A.03.02.03 B8. It states that students are required to earn one credit that includes the application of knowledge, tools, and skills to solve practical and extend to solve practical problems and extend human capabilities. This reflects the basis of our technology education program. As the task force looked at current graduation requirements and what skills and knowledge students would need when they graduated and went into the workforce or into post-secondary education, they learned of the need for more students to be engaged in computer science and engineering education. Recall the task force's guiding principles that any changes we recommend should ensure a focus on knowledge and skills, personalization and equity. Computer science and engineering were certainly skills we recognized as ones all students needed in the future, not just those students who might elect or be encouraged to move into those programs. We um, learned that since 2015, that Maryland State Department of Education had expanded options available, that there were options for students to fulfill the technology education graduation requirement. Options included courses in computer science and engineering. And additionally, representatives from Maryland local school systems and higher education participated on a national team to revise standards for technology education to include stronger connections to engineering and computer science content. I am pleased to say that in 2020, all of our school systems offer courses in computer science, engineering, and technology education for students to fulfill the current technology graduation requirements. I also wanted to mention that in 2016, the Maryland State Department of Education participated in the development of the national K-12 computer science framework. As a result, we were able to use the framework as a foundation to develop Maryland's K-12 computer science standards. The standards identify what students should know and be able to do by grade level and four of the five concept areas that are displayed on this slide. On the slide, next slide, you'll see that on this slide, you'll see the rationale. And I know I'm moving through this quickly, but it's really the same process all the way through each of the areas that have been approved to see what the um, regulation is and to see what the rationale was for doing it and then to see what the recommendation was. So on this slide, you see some of the rationale for why we believe we needed to transition from tech ed to computer science engineering. In addition to the rationale listed on this slide, which I um, will cover some of them and I know you've read them, I wanted to mention that there has been a big push across the nation over the last several years to adopt policies that support K-12 computer science education. For instance, on November 2nd, 2017, Executive Order 01.01.2017.27, Computer Science and Professional Development, 
signed by Governor Larry Hogan, declared computer science a priority in Maryland public schools. This executive order was further supported by legislation passed by the General Assembly in, of Maryland on April 2018, requiring that all public schools in Maryland offer a computer science course by the 2021 or the 2021-22 academic school year. That was House Bill 281. So as noted in the rationale, it was recommended that there be a transition to a computer science engineering graduation one credit requirement that would include opportunities for students to fulfill graduation requirements through the completion of tech ed, computer science, or engineering courses. The recommendation was approved to move forward. Just one punch now. All right. So now I'm going to move on to the next slide. The fourth recommendation is still on credit and program four or five that we're covering now. The fourth recommendation of the task force under the credit and program portion of the task force's work was the graduation pathways. From the recommendation, you can see we recommended eliminating the pathway identified as advanced technology and requiring two basic pathways. One was a career and technical education program pathway, and one was a four-year college and university pathway. Both of those pathways also follow, allow for students who elect to go into a two-year post-secondary program. Currently, this is what's in place. Our present graduation requirement does not specify or define a pathway. This portion of the graduation regulation, frequently referred to as completer or completer sequence, requires that a student take two years of world language or a career technical education program or two credits in advanced technology. This portion of the regulation provides some direction that might imply a pathway. The task force believes that there should be more substance to this part of the regulation. One guiding principle of the task force was that all pathways or options be tied to an outcome that has meaning for students, both secondary education and or employers. That's under our area of personalization. Pathways also should be aligned to either post-secondary preparedness or workforce preparedness. In some programs, it may be addressing both outcomes. So as noted through the discussion of pathways, task force members believe that students should be meaningfully prepared for a specific destination. Much time was spent talking to a wide number of stakeholders and looking at available data regarding students when they leave our high schools. We talked with business people, two and four year higher education institution members, principals, CTE supervisors, and administrators. After review of that data and feedback from those stakeholders, it was recommended that we eliminate the advanced technology option and require students focus on one of the two pathways, the CTE pathway, or the four-year college or university pathway. Task Force members believed these two pathways would meet the needs of our students now and in many years to come. The High School Graduation Task Force recommended the following pathways be developed, and I'll just mention them, mention them one more time. Successful completion of a state-approved career and technical education program, or successful completion of a four-year college or university program that includes two years of the same world language, Algebra two and two, two of three sciences as lab sciences. The board approved that we move forward with those two pathways. That's because it's a priority of the Maryland State Department of Education to prepare students for post-secondary or and or career success. These graduation options presented create clear pathways for students with no dead ends. These options allow students to immediately enter the workforce and to or for your institutions. By consolidating these two pathways to these two pathways, we've maximized opportunities for students by aligning to post-secondary education and industry entry requirements. Within each pathway, students can individualize the courses that they take to align to their post-secondary and career goals. Now you might wonder why we said it was we were able to um, take out the advanced technology education pathway. 
So it's essential that we um, that all graduation options provide opportunities to education. The advanced technology education pathway, as it stands right now, does not definitively provide either option for students. The Division of Career and College Readiness is in the process of working currently with stakeholders to improve advanced technology education to make it a CTE program of study. This will provide the opportunity for students to earn industry credentials that will make them employable for entry level positions in manufacturing, engineering, or technology education adjacent fields. As a result, advanced technology education no longer needs to be a standalone graduation option as it will be included as part of the CTE graduation pathway. With that, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Take a sip of water, please. The final recommendation under the topic of credits and program is that of dual enrollment. Task Force recommended that students who successfully complete a college course that is aligned with Maryland standards should receive high school credit. And after discussion in September 2019, the board approved this recommendation to move forward. We have statute that defines dual enrollment as a specified course in which a student is considered enrolled in the course at both the high school level and college level. Guidance is provided on dual enrollment by the Maryland State Department of Education, the Maryland Higher Education Commission, and the Maryland Longitudinal Data System them in terms of data. You may wonder why we're addressing this topic if there's already reference to it in statute. What the task force found during our review of the data and discussions with college and high school panelists and the task force members is that dual enrollment is not offered consistently across our state and the grades are not consistently reported for dual enrollment. According to the information we learned, this occurs for several reasons. Cost of the courses, whether or not the course is outside the graduation requirements, and the, difficulty in get, and the difficulty in getting data back um, to the local school systems. The task force believes this is a matter of equity, opportunity for students if we do not offer similar courses and accept them for credit for all of our school systems. So since we had a community college representative or higher ed representative serving on our task force, along with many other school system stakeholders, we had tremendous amounts of discussion about this area of regulation and how to work towards more equity and how it was being offered across our school districts. From the research, we learned that students who participate in dual enrollment are more likely to enroll in college, earn more college credits all enrolled, and are more likely to graduate from college on time. We learned that dual enrollment should be employed strategically. And we also discussed the need for community colleges to become more consistent in what is offered as a part of the designated course. Most importantly, if the course was to be used for a high school credit, it should be aligned to the high school standards for the high school course it was replacing. As an outgrowth of the task force review of issues related to dual enrollment, the following recommendations were made. First one was that we work with community colleges to ensure that courses used for high school credit were aligned to the high school standards for the high school courses they were replacing. Work towards those courses um, being offered consistently towards uh, across community colleges in Maryland. And that these may need to begin by just refining the articulation agreements between school systems and their community colleges. And then perhaps work with them to be consistent across community colleges themselves. And we also wanted to ensure that high school students who successfully completed a college course it's aligned with the Maryland College and Career Ready standards, or an elective credit of graduation requirements would receive high school credit for the course. And so we put that standard in place and we were agreed and we decided to move forward with that. And so now I'm pleased to say that those are the standards that are the um, actual recommendations from the task force that were aligned with the um, credit and program section of the discussion the high school task force had. Now we're going to move into diplomas and regulatory recommendations. Now I know it's 1223 and it was about when you were going to have your um, break. Do you want to take a break or just keep going? Because I can 
The next part of this is not nearly as long as the last part. What is your preference? Unless the board objects, I would say let's continue. Thank you. We can do that. Okay, so now now that we completed the recommendations in the credit program task force, we're going to move into the diploma section of the task force work. I want to point out that I had, um, well, actually, I fixed this slide because this slide didn't read exactly as, uh, in the materials as it reads now because I went back and looked and we had approved the diploma, so I put approved on here. I just wanted you to know that I'll replace that on the um, website as soon as we're finished with this meeting. I mentioned earlier that we had two board members that served on the task force. I also mentioned that each task force member served on one of three subcommittees. Former board president, Dr. Justin Hardings, was a member of the diploma subcommittee. This is Leah Tiederman, a, pro a program manager in our division of assessment and accountability and instructional technology, chaired this task force. The recommendation regarding the diploma was actually the first recommendation the Board of Education discussed and they approved maintaining one diploma as reflected on the timeline. And that was done in April of 2019. Our current regulation states that the Maryland High School Diploma should be awarded to any student who meets the requirements and that those requirements are noted on your screen. State enrollment, credit and service requirements, local school system graduation requirements, and state assessment requirements. Just because Maryland has had a single diploma for over 40 years, it's not really a reason for continuing that practice. So when you see this as a recommendation from the group, I want you to know that a lot of time and energy went into looking at that. So the task force members spent quite a bit of time researching and looking at research and what stakeholders said and how it aligned with our principles of equity. Following much review of the literature, discussions, with business representatives, college and university representatives, school administrators and teachers, the task force determined the Maryland diploma should retain a single Maryland high, Maryland should retain a single Maryland high school diploma. And when I mention all those groups, often those were panels that we had come in and speak to the entire task force because we felt it was so critical to hear from the actual people that were dealing with these. And here's what we found from looking at our research. Policy experts recommended diplomas aligned with college and career ready standards should be the default diploma for all students. This sets the same expectations for all students. Employers have indicated that the single Maryland diploma succinctly conveys meaning to employers on the capabilities of high school students. This recommendation supports the task force's guiding principle of equity. A single diploma does not separate or label students as better or lesser than other students and does not limit student opportunities by presenting to potential employers or colleges that diplomas may not be equal. Maryland has, a single, has had a single diploma for over 40 years. Long-standing precedent allows the Maryland High School Diploma to convey significant meaning beyond K-12. By continuing to have a single diploma, Maryland can further build on the meaning of a high school, Maryland High School Diploma and the board approved the continuation, as I said, of a single diploma. So the next recommendation you see says that we're going to look at seals, endorsements, and awards and develop a process, and that's what this, this particular one says, develop a process for the adoption of national seals and the creation of state endorsements to ensure that seals and endorsements meet established requirements. And then it shows another piece of the regulation that is already um, in Comar, and that says that local boards can create something at their local level if they want. Okay, so while the single Maryland diploma succinctly conveys meaning to employers on the capabilities of high school students, the meaning is limited with no opportunity for students to convey unique or exceptional skills. The task force's guiding principles support equity and personalization standard requirements across the state of Maryland for those three honors ensure that all students have equitable access regardless of the local school system in which they attend. They also allow for the uniqueness of Maryland's local school systems to meet the specific needs of their geographic regions and their students and families. In terms of why 
the task force recommended developing a process for adoption of seals and endorsements, they felt it was a way of recognizing the special accomplishments of students while ensuring consistency in what those accomplishments represented. As I noted on the previous slide, the task force's guiding principles of equity and personalization support this recommendation. In terms of equity, students will have the option of seals and endorsements that have been uniformly established. The seals and endorsements may appear directly on the diploma as a signal to higher ed and employers. Since seals and endorsements are uniform statewide, they would signal identical accomplishments for all students with similar honors. In terms of personalization, seals and endorsements are all for completion of activities and outcomes beyond the minimum established by the state. And the board approved that we establish a process for doing this. And that's all that recommendation is for, is to establish a process. Let me go on to the next recommendation, um, which is college and career ready endorsement. Awards for students who meet the college and career readiness assessment options. And the MOU between, I'm going to explain all of this, and between the memorandum of understanding between the Maryland Association of Community Colleges and public school superintendents, because it supports something that's in statute, actually the College and Career Readiness Completion Act of 2013. The MOU defines what performance level students must reach on an English language arts assessment or math assessment that will indicate the student can enter a college level course in ELA, English language arts, or math, and be successful. In other words, they can enter a college level class without having to take a remedial class. They are college and career ready. Again, this endorsement would require <coughs> students to go above and beyond the minimum state diploma requirements. So it would be aligned with what's in that MOU. And that actually uh, brought it along is reflected in another document we have, which I'd be happy to share, which we do not have with you, but it's called the um, Toolkit to Determine Students' College and Career Ready Designation under the College and Career Readiness and Completion Act of 2013, and it contains the MOU. So I'm gonna move on to, which I'm gonna now lose my place. Okay, the task force's guiding principles of equity and personalization support this recommendation. And additionally, analysts recommend aligning high school requirements with higher education admission standards, especially as a way to close the preparation gap for under-resourced students. The task force also felt it was important to provide intrinsic incentives to students. In other words, this endorsement would be that intrinsic incentive. The recommendation also leveraged the efforts underway in local school systems around college and career readiness by providing tangible benefits for students in the form of an endorsement. The board approved pursuing the college and career ready endorsement. Then we go to the next slide, which is a recommendation for career and, career and technical education endorsement. The task force's other proposed staff uh, state endorsement is a career and technical education endorsement. And it's awarded to students who successfully meet requirements determined by the Division of College and Career Readiness. And again, the endorsement requires students to go above and beyond the minimum state diploma requirements. Requirements might include participation in work-based learning, an opportunity for that, or in career technical student organization, or the requirements could include a performance measurement, such as a qualifier for an industry-recognized credential for students um, where it would be appropriate for that particular area. The task force knows that an inherent inequities might be um, there in terms of performance assessments. And they say that we really need to just look at those uh, assessments because some of them are delivered after a student leaves school. So it should be a consideration, but not the only determiner of a student getting a college and career ready assessment. It really needs to be based on the work that was done in that area, and it needs to be above and beyond the requirements for, for that particular program. So reflected um, here are some of the reasons that led the task force recommendation to have a career and technical education endorsement, exposure to career and technical education, especially coursework that is concentrated in a particular pathway has been shown to increase the likelihood of student graduation to your college entry and employment with higher wages would ensue from that. 
This recommendation, again, leverages the efforts underway in local school systems around college and career readiness by providing tangible benefits for students in the form of an endorsement. CTE endorsements or college technical education endorsements have been implemented in many other states, creating a precedent for a similar thing to occur in Maryland. And the board approved that we could pursue career and technical education endorsements. So remember that the first recommendation I showed you was pursuing setting up the criteria and really um, addressing them. And then in those two areas, we would look at college and career ready. And we would look at the CTE's college technical education endorsements. Those would be two that we would look at the state endorsements. I also want to recommend, uh, recognize one other thing that happened in terms of our um, board discussions. And I don't know that I'm on the same uh, slide. Okay. So one thing that um, was recognized was there is a certificate of program completion that we have available for students who have significant disabilities and who may not be pursuing a graduation diploma, high school diploma, um, a general ed one. And so another recommendation that resulted from the work done by the diploma subcommittee was to um, award Actually, let me just start over on that piece again, I'm sorry. The recommendation was made to have a work group um, evaluate and potentially modify that certificate. The task force review of the research found that the strongest predictor of successful transition from school to work for students with significant disabilities are high school employment experiences and parental expectations of post-school, post-high school employment. Yet representatives from the special education community reported to the task force that parents often report having different expectations for their students with for their own students with disabilities and that school staff often have different expectations especially when it comes to further education employment and independent living a revised certificate of program completion would allow personalization for these students to align their high school experience to the post high school goals just as it does for students earning the Maryland High School Diploma. Maryland employers stated that they cannot evaluate either the Maryland High School Certificate of Program Completion or the student's transcript to determine the student's potential for success in a particular position because Maryland is an employment first state. And Maryland's High School Certificate of Program Completion does not um, include any requirements that are centered on supporting the employment force framework. So we knew we had work to do in this area. So I wanted to show you what had happened as a result of that. Because we had said at the end of this discussion when we were um, at the board meeting back in April of 2019, we said that we would certainly suggest that we move forward on that particular um, recommendation. So the task force acknowledged that um, we did need to do that and we would review the requirements. And here's what they thought we should set up. Task Force acknowledged that not all appropriate stakeholders were a part of this particular task force, and such recommendations required expertise outside the current members. They recommended the board convene a work group with the following charge, is, charges. Um, review the requirements for the Maryland Certificate of Completion. Determine if the Maryland Certificate of Completion should include more specific or rigorous requirements. Explore expanding CTE pathways for students with disabilities. Determine if changes needed to be made in Comar regarding the name and the description of the certificate of program completion and make recommendations on appropriate verbiage if changes were necessary. Develop standards for endorsements that could be added to a Maryland certificate of program completion to include academic and or work-based learning requirements to endorsements that would mirror the endorsements that were proposed by the high school diploma. This work group should review available literature and research on credentials for students with disabilities, explore similar credentials in other states, engage with experts from workforce and community and MSDE. And the workforce should, or the work group, should also encourage student, a study of the impact of receiving a certificate of program completion on students post high school outcomes. So this is what happened as a result of that. The board had approved that recommendation and we moved forward and we convened, had Mrs. Marcella Frankowski, our assistant state superintendent of the Division of Early Intervention and Special Education, 
convene a work group that was representative as suggested in the um, recommendations from the task force, and she served as its chair. A summary of their work and recommendations is included here, but it's just here as a summary for you, because this work will have to come back to the state board for its review and approval. As you can see, the work group believes that the certificate should stay as it is until the language around endorsements and standards has been developed. At that time, the work group would reconvene and develop its recommendations in alignment with what is done for the Maryland High School Diploma. So she's very much aligning everything with what um, the task force did, the Maryland High School Graduation Task Force. This is the recommendation that came out of her work group. It's not part of the original recommendations that you need to vote on at this point. This will come back to you later. But the task force recommendation was to convene, um, you know, as I said, convene a work group to look at the certificate of program completion. And that was approved and completed. We've done that part. In terms of the work group recommendation, we'll have Mrs. Um, Frankowski come back. But this is what her recommendation looks like. Developing endorsements that could be added to the current certificate of program completion as well as the standards noted below to achieve any of the three endorsements. And she wants to wait and see what our standards look like for our endorsements. And then she would go back and possibly look at areas such as post-secondary education, work-ready employment career, and community citizenship. So we'll be bringing her report back to this group to look at in the future. And I did think it was important for you to know that um, that work is being done because we think it is critical that we look at what's happening for the students who have significant disabilities. Okay, so now we're here for the um, area that you haven't discussed before. So now you've seen the 10 recommendations on the task force that were approved. Five of the recommendations were credit and program. Five of the recommendations were under the area of diplomas. All of those recommendations were approved to move forward to include in the regulation. The next area of work by the task force is in the area of assessments. Our second board member serving on the task force sat on this subcommittee. That was Dr. Michelle Guyton, now Delegate Guyton. This subcommittee was chaired by Mrs. Brianna Creed, who is in the assessment operations program, who is the assessment operations program manager in the division of assessment, accountability, and information technology. This is the only area of the task force recommendations has not been previously presented to the board for discussion and review. It was actually scheduled to come to the board last March. And as you know, at that point, things went a little off schedule and hence we are now bringing it to you for your consideration at this board meeting. Of the two items on this timeline, we have already resolved one of them. 3.2, which reads, require students to participate in the High School Maryland Integrated Science Assessment until determination of an end of course assessment for science. You may recall this was a, pro a problem that you, were, uh, you identified as we began looking at our MISA data. This assessment covers the content and it's three different courses and our school systems don't all administer those three courses at the same time and we heard that repeatedly last year how that was going to be difficult to know where to um, administer this assessment. And some school systems were administering it after the first course, and then students, of course, weren't successful because they hadn't had the content of the other two courses. And some were admit waiting until the third year um, after they had all three courses and they weren't administering until then. And then students didn't have time that they needed for more than a year to retake the assessment. You solved that problem this past year when you approved moving the MISA assessment to the end of the life sciences class and modifying the content to cover the content of the life sciences course. So we don't, now don't really need to deal with that assess, that administration or that assessment um, recommendation because we've really dealt with it already by putting in the life sciences MISA course, which still deals with next generation science standards, but focuses the content on life sciences. What we do have to look at is the recommendation, it's 3.1, requiring algebra, English, government, and science assessments to be end of course assessments that contribute to 20% of the final course grade and remove requirements that students receive a certain assessment score for graduation as a standalone requirement as the exit exam. 
As I did with the earlier components, I'm going to share what our current regulation says, then what our recommendation was, and then the rationale. I'll outline some of the issues so that you have the basic understanding of what the task force recommended and why. And then I'd like to return in January meeting, maybe you'll have some time for this meeting, but return again in January after you've had time to reflect on what you learned today to perhaps review what is in the task force report and look at some of the data connected to these assessments and then to respond to any questions or concerns that you have. So I'm hopeful that in January we'll be able to really fully um, explain the issues behind this recommendation. But right now we're going to look at what the current regulation is. The current regulation says that to be awarded the Maryland High School Diploma, all students, including elementary and middle school students, who take high school level courses, um, shall take the Maryland High School Assessment in Algebra, Science, English, and Government after the student completes the required course or courses. And I just want to mention it's laid out that way because, as many of you know, that in middle school, and now sometimes even as early as sixth grade, we have students taking the algebra assessment. And often, um, if that happens in sixth grade, then our regulation says they will take that high school assessment course, I mean, that assessment at the end of that um, period of time. So they would take it at the end of sixth grade. So that is why the regulation says, regardless of where they take the course, that's where they're going to take the um, assessment. So students are required to take the following Maryland high school assessments. They have to do, and you just heard um, Dr. Judd can say this, they have these following high school assessments, Algebra 1, English 10, U.S. Government, and MESA, which is now, of course, going to be like Sciences MESA in the future year. Each LSS, local school system, is required to provide the appropriate assistance to students to strengthen their areas of weakness if they didn't earn a proficient score on either of the Maryland high school assessments. A student is able to satisfy the graduation requirement through the bridge plan for academic validation. If the student passed the course or courses related to the assessment but failed one or more of the assessments, the students have, um, will have to also demonstrate uh, success by getting involved in the Bridge to Excellence program. However, uh, well, I just said that. Okay, so they have to just, um, determine success on the Maryland High School assessment when they take the test after the course. And if they're not successful in that, then they often will start a bridge assessment to provide some remediation to them so that the next time the assessment is provided, they can take the assessment again. And I think I probably skipped a page. All right, so now we're going to go to the rationale. Here's the rationale that led us to our task force recommendation. I apologize for my stumbling, but I am thirsty. I'm going to take another sip of water, please. Okay. Here's the rationale that led to that task force recommendation. Over the last five to 10 years, there's been a lot of debate about the value of test scores versus student course grades. The task force spent a lot of time looking at that research and also at what, the happening, uh, what was happening across our nation. I'm only showing a few of the factors that caused the task force to make the recommendation it did. The high stakes exit exam have a negative impact on our minority, economically disadvantaged, special needs, and ELL students. Because these are graduation requirements, even if the students pass the course, yet don't pass the exam, they have to continue taking the exam until they do pass it. We've seen too many students who are not good test takers get very discouraged and waste much time taking the time to either get involved in bridge or to practice these assessments so that they can pass them. Research has shown that a student's course grade is a stronger predictor of college and career success than standardized assessments. The standardized assessment is just a one-day snapshot regardless of how the student physically or emotionally feeling, regardless of what factors are having an impact on the student, even if the student has a good grasp of the content knowledge that's required. Course grades are over time. They can show a student's motivation, they can show their work ethic, they can show their perseverance, as well as their level of knowledge. The task force also discussed concerns that student performance will drop if high stakes exit exams are removed. 
We discussed that considerably. However, research on accountability suggests that it does not improve achievement for all students. The task force was therefore confident that its recommendation to shift tests to end of course exams will still maintain school accountability and student achievement without the negative and disproportionate effects that are sometimes associated with high school exit exams. And I know you've all heard of the impact of exit exams sometimes and it's believed that students don't always pay attention to them because they know how they're doing in the course anyway. Other states are also grappling with the issues and concerns associated with high stakes exams, and they have made the decision to move away from them. As a matter of fact, some have moved entirely away from assessments, some have moved to making an end of course assessments. And again, other states have found ways to ensure high school assessments are rigorous and aligned to state standards, meaningful and equitable without the burden of being a high stakes exit exam. Many states who use end of course exams for student accountability count them as 20% of the respective course grade. So the task force recommendation for assessments separates the high school assessments from high school graduation requirements. It supports our guiding principle of equity. The task force noted the valuable tool that assessments provide to instruction and in the accountability program. That's why the task force recommends the high school assessment become and the course assessments that contribute to the student's final grade. We've done a lot of work to make sure those course assessments are aligned with the content that's being taught in those courses. This ensures that the high school assessments are aligned to content standards, incentivize student performance, and act as meaningful instructional tools while still addressing issues of inequity. And at the time the task force met, Many states had recently changed their high stakes assessments, as I said, in similar ways to being proposed here. And limited information was informed by research, data, and experts that task force might want to ensure that this change did not have unintended consequences for their own students. So that is that recommendation that we move away from the exit exam and to including the high school assessment as an end of course exam that would count 20% of the grade. So I still have one more recommendation to cover, and that is recommendation 3.3, bridge plan for academic validation. And right now it says in there that if state board accepts recommendation 3.1 and 3.2, the bridge plan may no longer be necessary, but their recommendation was written before we solved our high school MISA assessment issue. So really, it's just looking at recommendation 3.1. If 3.1 is approved, perhaps the bridge plan for academic validation recommendation isn't necessary, but we want you to consider a few things as you look at it. It recognizes, the task force recognizes the importance of a cautious approach and supports options that ensure decisions are informed with data and research. research. It's aligned to the guiding principles of equity the task force recognizes the bridge plan and or a similar concept may well serve certain students and should not be wholly eliminated without consideration for students who need that kind of additional support of some kind of remediation between the time they have their assessment and their end of course or, or end, end, end of course so this chart that and i'm sorry i just have to back up again so that recommendation is to continue the bridge plan for academic validation until we've had time to actually look at some data from it. Don't just throw it out when you throw if and when you throw out the um, end of course, not the end of course assessment, but the assessment as an exit exam. All right, so now this chart, and then thank goodness I'll have talked all the way through it and perhaps can get water to fill my glass. Okay, so this chart is really just showing you everything that we just talked about. It shows all of the um, actual recommendations that you had seen, shows when you saw them, and that you had approved them. And then it shows the recommendation that you still need to approve, plus the other piece of the recommendation that's on there that was um, 3.2, that was MISA. So right now it shows you have the academic, um, the recommendation to deal with for assessment. And then at the end of this, the idea is that we would come back now. This is this meeting maybe I don't know if it's over sooner, 
or if we're going to still talk today. But at the time, we thought we were going to bring back some additional data about the assessments and look at some of that data I mentioned in terms of how students perform on it and why we thought this was a good recommendation and actually look at some of what other states have done. Um, but in terms of um, what we're going to do, the idea was that once this is all determined and once you've had an um, opportunity to talk about the assessment recommendation, that we would then provide you with a copy of the regulation. And the regulation is fairly uh, lengthy because it contains a lot of information. Not only this, but it also has other little pieces that will get cleared up, such as saying park, and we don't want to say park anymore, but it'll say um, MCAP. So little things like that, but we still need to go back and look at that entire regulation. We would bring that back to you in January, in addition to um, what, what you would do with the assessment regulation to discuss. So with that, I am going to bring closure to this part of my my um, discussion and ask if there are any questions or comments. And note that I have lots of people online with me that certainly would be able to address questions if I'm not able to. Okay, so it's Thank a lot you. of quiet. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Williamson. Very, very interesting. Um, let me now uh, give our board members an opportunity to comment and to ask questions. If I can again get you to um, speak up because I'm still having just a bit of difficulty finding you on the uh, gallery. President Crawford, if Jeannie Alley, I have a question. Please, yes. I actually have two. One is, um, and thank you, it was a terrific presentation and a lot of good information. And I understand why it was tough on you to not even be able to take a, a sip of water there. Um, in the, the dual credit portion of it, it says that it should be an institution of higher education in the state. Did the committee consider uh, online schools in terms of uh, dual credit and how would they fit into those requirements if you did? Well, I think the online credit, if it's a if it's a college dual line course, would be able to operate under the same um, guidelines guidance that we set up. The problem with the courses right now is that um, they weren't getting information about the courses to begin with at the at the high school level. Sometimes, if a course was offered at the college level, they, the student hadn't gotten permission to take that course at the college level in place of a high school credit they were taking or as a part of an elective. And so there just was the communication gap and um, there was a need to really try to clarify what that was and to try and set something up where we said that if students do take courses that are aligned with the high school standards that they're going to get credit for it, but it would need to be approved as a course that did meet those, that was aligned with our standards. So if the course standards were aligned in the dual enrollment of the online course, I would have to think that it would be acceptable. It's in, it's in regulation, however, and I'm going to page 30 of your slide deck. It says it's a secondary, duly enrolled in a secondary school in the state and to an institution of higher education in the state. So I just request that the committee think about being more specific about uh, an institution of higher education that's online might not have a state boundary, but is authorized in the state. Well, right now what's happening, what could happen is, I mean, it says it dually enrolled means both, but some students have gotten permission to take college level courses and not been dually enrolled. They took the college level course right. um, at a different time of the year or summer after school. And that was part of the issue. And there were members of the committee that told me that if they took it in one county and they were getting credit for it, they ought to be able to get credit for it in another another system. There were lots of reasons why not. And the reason it says um, that the Maryland State Department of Education and the college would agree that the course um, met the standards was that we would be looking at our content standards, um, and then so would so would, we already give approval for those courses. So. Yeah, I, under, college. I understand that it has to align to our standards and the, per, and the student has to receive permission. I guess the part where I'm not confident is 
if someone went to one of these national online uh, secondary institutions, would they be able to still participate in the dual credit program? Not just they get permission to take the course, but they get dual credit. Well, maybe I don't understand you clearly enough, but what I'm going to say is um, anything that would count for a high school credit course would have to be approved by it being a high school credit by the high school, by the, by the local district. So they would have to have had a conversation about that they felt that that course met one of the requirements the student had. Does that make sense to you? I, it does, but I think we're still talking past each other because my concern is that the regulation, if I was a principal in a school considering a student had, who had brought me a course from a national online provider and, and I looked at the regulation, it says it has to be an institution of higher education in the state and therefore I would be questioning whether or not it qualified as an institution of higher education in the state. Okay, I hear you. Okay, I, that I, don't, I would have to look. I don't know. It does say in the state. Okay, so if you could if you could follow up on that, that would be helpful. And then I have one other question, which I just didn't understand. On slide 39, for the college ready endorsement, it said it should be earned by the end of grade 11. So if I'm taking classes still in 12th grade, I don't, that part I wanted some clarification on. Part of the um, policy that is, um, and I can't think of the college and current ready policy, is that if students do not pass, are not ready at the end of grade 11, and are not college career ready, deemed college and career ready, that they have to enter a transition course, and they get a course that will provide them support. And that is done in conjunction sometimes with the college, sometimes it's a course that we have in place, so that when students, the whole, whole idea is that when students eventually go to college, they don't end up having to be in remedial courses. So if I took, if I was a student and I took one of the classes that would qualify me for this endorsement in 12th grade, I really couldn't receive the endorsement because I needed to have it completed by 11th grade. Is that the right way to understand that? No, I don't think that's what I mean. So repeat your question again, obviously I did not grasp okay. it. So um, the endorsement on this slide says that it should, should earn by the end of grade 11. So I'm saying, suppose there's a course that I need to have to be able to demonstrate that I'm college and career ready, but I take that course in 12th grade. Does right. that mean that I am not eligible for this endorsement because I hadn't completed it by the end of 11th grade? No, no, you can get endorsed by 11th grade, but it would be able to be endorsed in 12th grade too. It's when you graduate, what's gonna be on your diploma? Are you college and career ready? Okay, so you're just saying that the when you're doing planning you should be able to complete whatever work is done by the end of the 11th grade I think, I think just, to to just to clarify this is uh karen salmon um it's because we have a law that says it's it is a it is a uh it was done in 2013 right, right. it says students must uh, show college and career readiness by the end of 11th grade. So that's why the regulation is stated the way it is. The endorsements are related to what the student's overall program is when they complete their diploma. So there right. are two different things. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Any additional questions or comments from the board? This is Ms. Morrow. I have a couple, Please. I have a couple questions. Um, and I'll, I'll limit myself to to the assessment part, okay, because I know I have a lot of questions sometimes. So, in terms of the the logistics, I guess of of switching from the standalone assessment to making it part of the course grade. How is that going to work in terms of like timing? I mean, I know usually kids take Park MCAP in the spring. We don't have scores until August or September. So is is MCAP going to be able to be graded in a in a much quicker time frame and then is that still going to be kind of in a normal spring testing window or would that be moved later for those courses? I guess I'm as as a parent of a high schooler I'm trying to picture how um, how that transition will work logistically. I think first, the first concern of the task force was about seniors. 
so that we would make sure we would be able to have seniors assessments um, scored in some way by the end of the time they need them to be able to graduate. <clears throat> other students are taking them at other years. You heard Dr. Simon say some are taking them years younger. Um, we are looking at, into this. It's one of the things we would bring back some examples. We um, have talked to other states. Um, this is Judkin, Dr. Judkins has um, talked to people in other states that are administering as end of course to see how they are getting them scored. We've looked at if we have to have a different um, format for our assessment, whether it's going to be a more short form assessment um, in terms of writing what has to be written. We have looked at timing when it would be given. Um, but keeping all those things in mind, we know we have that would be work we would have to have done. And that is one of the things the task force also discussed um, was this was going to be a critical piece of what we wanted to do. But other places were doing it. We do it right now with our graduations with our um, students when they get end of course assessments at the end of the school year. We have to get them scored before they leave so they know what courses they're going to be able to take. So we would have to make similar kinds of um, considerations for that. But yes, that is something that has to be discussed. And maybe in January when we come back, we could have a little bit more information for you about logistics, but it certainly was a piece of what um, the committee was concerned about. Okay, and the other the other piece, and this is this may be something that, that was already presented to the task force somewhere along the line. Um, you talk about the correlation or comparison, I guess, between test scores and grades. Um, was was there a presentation or information done kind of in the last few years about comparison about park with great students are actually getting has that has that been done i th i think i'm going to say yes there is and the other piece i'm going to say is um I, I mentioned i was in a group uh, regarding math right now and we're looking at um what's happening with math as you're transitioning from high school to college and what kinds of things we should be looking at. And there are a number of um, community colleges now and even the university is looking at the idea of looking at course grades, grade point averages, because they're finding that that really has a lot more um, uh, stamina, I don't want to say stamina, I don't know what word I'm looking for, a lot more um, credibility in terms of how students are performing. So we do, I think we do have some data that we could bring back and show you with that. Okay, I'd, I'd be interested in seeing that, um, just kind of the, the historical comparison, if we have it. Thank you. We don't do a lot of collecting course grades here. Well, we do collect them. We don't run those, those kinds of um, comparisons, but I'll see what we can pull up for you. Because there were some things done across the state in the nation. nation. Thank right. you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Dr. Getty. I agree that um, generally speaking, there's two pathways to graduation being college, college ready and the workforce group of students. But within the workforce group of students, there are students who don't qualify for career in tech by grade point average attendance or the lack of a prerequisite class or something like that. What is their pathway to graduation? Um, if they don't participate in career and tech. Well, we're saying they're going to be, we feel it's our responsibility to make sure they are workforce prepared or college career ready prepared. Um, prepared. Um, perhaps perhaps um, we could ask uh, if it's online, Sarah Sarah. to address that question because I, I want to be careful that we're not looking at there's only either or because there are some there's some additional and you know, there are some students, for example, that may be in the career and tech uh, pathway, but they're in a biomedical program and they're going to go to a four year university. Sure. So there, there's a lot of, you know, we're, we're, we haven't developed that area enough right now. And I think, Dr. Getty, you're pointing out something um, that we need to look at as well. But perhaps Tierra could address that concern that you just raised, because there shouldn't be students that are not able to do a career in technology program for the reasons you cited. So I'll let uh, I'll let Tierra handle that question. Thank you. Yes, well, good afternoon, members of the State Board of Education. So. Um, we currently have over 60 different career and technical education programs of study, and we are expanding them. 
there are several programs of study. So there's some programs of study that are limited in enrollment because of class size, because of um, the equipment that's there. Um, however, most students um, will have access to CTE programs of study. And as we mentioned, um, as Carol mentioned in her presentation, that advanced technology education pathway, we are bringing that as a part of a CTE program of study. So, um, so we are continuing to expand these programs to ensure that all students have the opportunity to engage in a CTE program of study. And a lot of our um, CTE students actually graduate as um, they, they complete the CTE requirements and they complete the requirements for entry into a four-year university. Dr. Getty, does that does that explanation help? A little bit. I actually thought Dr. Getty was asking about low performing students and yes, ones who yes. were, were not here for attendance or we're not here, we're not doing their work. And and I still agree with what Dr. what Mrs. Booker Dwyer said. And we have enough pathways and it becomes something of function other than just the pathway, it's what we're doing to keep students engaged in school. I think that would be, I think so. Okay. Mr. Crawford, I think Jason had a question earlier. I don't know if he still does. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for the presentation. I actually served on the task force um, back in <laughs> 2018 when I was still a freshman. Um, I did have a question, question though about the increase in the health graduation requirement and so I'm wondering if that would mean that the current health curriculum would be sort of just spread out throughout the entire year instead of half a year or if um, new topics and units were being added and if so what those topics would be. I, th I think we still have the same, Ms. Spinata is on the line too I believe. But I think that we have the same topics. The problem is we don't have time to adequately address them. And I think there's not a decision that has to be in course. But Susan, are you on the line? Yes, I am. And you hit the nail on the head. Um, that's exactly the supervisors have already been working on how this might play out. And depending on the local school system, they may make it two courses. One, generally students, as you know, get it out of the way, if you will, in their freshman year. And they, there are lots of topics that impact them as they get older. So it would make more sense to take the second half later. Um, the framework has a, that they developed this summer and revised because of the new regulation allows uh, the health course to expand. And you may recall, this is all skills-based so we're not just talking about finite pieces of information, but how to address all of these uh, challenges that, that students face as they're in high school regarding health education. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? We do. Is that uh, Mr. DeShields? Yes, uh, th uh, thank you. And uh, Dr. Williamson, thank you for that uh, uh, report. It is uh, as much information that's important for us to consider. I just wanted to ask one question in regard to the assessment recommendation that we're going to be looking at uh, maybe a, a little more detail next month. But are there other states uh, that are using um, this kind of uh, assessment method by removing uh, the assessment score for graduation as a standalone requirement, or are we going to be one of the first? And the reason I'm asking the question is because when it's time for us to evaluate how students in Maryland are doing as compared to students in other states, will there be some comparison method that is equitable among all states that we can get a sense of how our students are performing. I, I do know that there are some other states. I do not have the names of them right now, but I can certainly 
get those. And I know that Mrs. Uh, Dr. Judkins has had conversation with several of them because as the task force was meeting, there was concern about what we would, how we would be able to organize to do this, especially in terms of how would that assessment be offered? Would it be at the end of the year? How, how do you get it scored? And so we have had conversations with the systems that have put that in place. Some of them had them in place and have now gone away from any assessment. Some of them are still in place. So we'll have a way to compare, but um, I can bring you more specific information at the next meeting. And I don't know if Dr. Judkins is still on here. She does have probably more knowledge about that. I'm still on. And there are okay. quite a few states that um, are using end of course. And so we've collected that data and we have, um, they're always open to conversations to assist us in how they're achieving um, a quick turnaround for scores and um, also talking with our um, administration scoring and reporting vendor on what the requirements would be to get that quick turnaround. So it is possible and there are many other states who are doing it. And Mr. Shields, that is really uh, the crux of some of the information we'll be presenting in January. So we'll have, I'm glad to uh, have your questions on record because we had intended to, to address those, but this is the kind of information we will be bringing back to you. We didn't want to overload you uh, with everything today. Wanted to, uh, to have this um, time in between um, so that you'd have uh, a chance to look at the whole. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are Ms. McCusker? Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Williamson, for that report. I do have just one question. Um, in looking at having dual enrollment courses uh, qualify for high school credit um, in their coursework to, to kind of take over for high school credit, are we anticipating um, a negative effect on staffing levels at high schools? as a result of students being enrolled in the college courses rather than in the high school courses. So if we have um, fewer students taking the high school courses, what is that going to do to our staffing levels on the high schools if we don't have as many kids enrolled in the building? That's what you bring up has always been an issue. Um, in terms of, I remember when I was in Queen Anne's, the issue with some of my departments was we don't want to offer those because then the kids are there and we don't have them here. We think we do a better job with some of the content than they do, that kind of thing. Um, maybe it will reduce the number of teachers that we need. We don't want to do that. But it, I don't think it's any different than right now. We have opportunities for students that need to excel, to be able to excel and take the kinds of courses they need to, whether they're doing more dual enrollment or if they're advanced placement. I think it's up to us to make sure we're offering things that will keep students attached to school. I personally believe there are lots of reasons students are in a high school and the kinds of um, opportunities they have there that if we had them all going to college with the same kinds of opportunities, obviously. Um, so yes, it could, it could have some impact. I don't know that it would have a great impact because right now um, there has been nothing stopping students from being able to take courses and take advanced placement right now. There is another group that worked out there at one point that was really pushing to have this be what happens for students from 10th grade on, that they just have dual enrollment or go to advanced placement. And I, don't, I personally don't believe that's what's best for all high school students, but I think that, you know, it's up to us as the educators to really look at what the programs are we have available for students and make sure that they have the kind of substance they need and realize that some opportunities to have an opportunity to be on campus or to have a dual enrollment class that you take at your school is is something we would encourage because it will help them when they go on to post-secondary but i don't know if we want to encourage them to i don't think i don't think that'll be a problem i really don't think that'll be a problem but that is me um, and some of you have a better idea so miss mccusker um it's interesting um i was uh going back in time when you asked that question to um, a young man that uh, ended up being hired by uh, the Talbot County Public School System as a math teacher and then went on to be the math supervisor who I actually got to watch taking a course with uh, Johns Hopkins on um, BC calculus because it, in those days, so I'm, I'm talking history here, in those days we didn't offer that for students. So there are going to be students that need some of those advanced courses um, that, you know, 
we haven't even defined what some of those courses might be in the future. And I think dual enrollment is a good way to incorporate some of that into our repertoire. The other thing I wanted to mention is that we have a lot of uh, community colleges teaching on our campuses um, so that students don't have to travel anywhere, which gets kind of at the point that Dr. Williamson was making. So I think we just have to have a lot of options for our students. And, um, you know, I don't think uh, we've seen any kind of decrease in the need for uh, you know, the other high school classes. So um, I think it's I think it is just making sure we have a broad range of courses available in the future. And um, some of these are one off courses that, you know, uh, we just need somebody to come in and, and teach that one course. So I think there'll be a lot of room for um, uh, choices for students, and I don't think it's going to impact the areas that you discuss. But always good to to bring these things up. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? I'm trying to scan right now and see if there are any additional. Uh, I have one, if you don't mind, one or something. Yes, please. Yes, sir. <laughs> Superintendent uh, covered uh, some of uh, what I was going to add. In some of the jurisdictions, what's happening uh, to make it easier for the students that don't have transportation to go to a college, community college, whatever. Some of the uh, community colleges are looking at the teachers and having them teach the courses under the auspices of the college, but it's a classroom teacher that's teaching it so actually they're they're working for the school system but they are teaching for the, the uh, college so that that won't get into taking teachers out that'll actually make them more relevant uh between the college and the uh, high school Very explore good. opportunities in um queen anne's and i know talbot did too where we had people that actually taught some of the classes and we've had college staff come on campus we've also taken um, groups of students in a bus and then taken them for a course for a semester to get them that experience so you know we do all kinds of things to make sure students have the right kinds of opportunities excellent mm -hmm. any additional comments or questions don't speak do it have one that here's someone yeah this is Jean Halley I just wanted to also add that as we've looked at regular access for high school courses where there may not be a teacher in the local school system and they could get it through some of the online opportunities that are available in the state we have seen that there's uneven um, access throughout the state and sometimes that problem is budgetary so as you look at the dual opportunities, there may be other obstacles. And I know you had commented on equity in that regard to make sure that all students have access. And I'm happy to see that the department is focused on that element. Very good. Anything more? Okay. Not seeing any additional comments or questions. Um, at this time, I um, would like to entertain a motion to adjourn and that we will reconvene tomorrow morning at 9.30. Do we have a motion? Motion, Jason Wu. Okay. Okay. Motion second. by Mr. Wu. And the second is... Two more. Uh, uh, I'll with your uh, corrections on both. Uh, I'm sorry, so I didn't hear the second. Who was the second? <coughs> Sean Bartley second it. Okay. Bartley. So it's been moved and properly second. Seeing no questions, uh, we'll just take a voice vote. All in favor of adjournment say aye. 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 Nay. Abstentions. Thank you very much, everyone. And we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 30. Thank you very much. Goodbye, y'all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Karen.